uh, I'm happy to welcome with you Daniela De Bono. Um, I will tell you a little bit about her person. She's a resident academic at the University of Malta. And I understood this, is, uh, this happened recently. Mm -hmm. um, she is also an affiliate of the Malmo Institute for the Studies of Migration, Welfare and Diversity, also co called My I M, Me I M. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, previously, she was Associate Professor in International Migration and Ethnic Relations at the Department of Global Political Studies also Malmo University. She held a Marie Curie Research Fellowship at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute and was a research fellow at this MIM <laughs> uh, I mentioned before. She was awarded a doctorate, awarded a doctorate from the University of Sussex where she was based at the Sussex Center for Migration Research. And uh, there's also the associate professorship from Malmo University. She has conducted long-term ethnographic research on irregular, irregularized, it's a complicated word, not, uh, it's a complicated phenomenon and uh, complicated word, regularized migration across the Mediterranean, border control and management in Malta, Lampedusa and Western Sicily. She also undertook an ethnographic study on deportation from Sweden. In relation to these projects, she has published on irregularized migration in the Medi Mediterranean, hospitality, and humanitarianism in the migration field, which is also the topic of her talk today, on return and deportation from the EU, on citizenship and on children's rights. Daniela is the country expert for Malta at the Global Citizenship Observatory, European University, University Institute, and has authored a series of reports on citizenship law and policy, naturalization and access to electoral rights. Daniela de Bona, I'm very glad that you are here with us and uh, speaking to us and um, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Every invitation to give a lecture is, a, is an opportunity for us both to, um, you know, get our thoughts um, together, but also to communicate our findings. I'd like to um, share my PowerPoint um, with you. So let's see if this works. So how does that look? Okay, very good. So this paper draws on my last long-term project, which involved multi-sided fieldwork in Lampedusa, in Agrigento, Palermo and Trapani, and Malta of over two years. Um, it is complemented by over 15 years of research in this area, the Central Mediterranean, with specifically with newly arrived refugees and people at risk of deportation. The mental health and well being of refugees is both an outcome of individual experience and structural um, violence. And as the peace studies scholar Johan Galtung um, has argued, it is difficult to separate the two. Mental health was not originally the primary focus of my research, but it emerged quite clearly as one of the recurring themes. As a political anthropologist, I seek to, in the words of the medical anthropologist Paul Farmer, tie together the ethnographically visible with the deeper structures that generate or perpetuate poverty and inequality, and with the meanings these events and processes are given. 
In this paper, I build on studies on the mental health of refugees arriving through the Mediterranean route and refugees in immigration detention and focus on the structural elements. In particular, I will be speaking about the European first reception system as it is implemented in the Mediterranean. It is colloquially known as the hotspot system or the hotspot approach. I will discuss the principles and the approach upon which this first reception system is constructed. In brief, despite the official terminology, this is not a system that is built to be hospitable. It is a system designed to address the requirements of border control. Several scholars have described this as a system enacted to exclude and control. Refugees arrive weary, exhausted and sometimes traumatized, and they have to navigate their way through an alien bureaucratized system, which is not aimed to protect or empower them. The system, in their words, reduces them to a number, controls them, confines them, breaks them. During a period in their lives when they most need care and compassion, implementing care within the system is often an impossible task because it is limited and restricted by the confines of the system and might even be counterproductive, ironically, to the well being of the individual refugee. This is what you know, most disembarkations look like. What you are seeing here is, um, so the, the first people who are brought to shore are corpses. And you can see the medical team. Um, and you can see on the port, in the port you have UNHCR, you have Frontex, you have different um, people who, whose job is either security oriented or largely humanitarian. So medical triage um, and so on. This is one of the quotes that maybe spurred a lot of my um, research. I will read this in full. Maybe the rest I will not read in full. I will just read the parts in red, but this one I think we need to read in full. Um, and for those of you who have watched Simshar yesterday, I think it's, um, you know, it continues on some of the themes that the film has touched upon. The sea is nothingness, Murad tells me. I hadn't eaten for four or five days. The last water finished hours ago. The boat was just drifting and people around me were sleeping or maybe dead. I tried to keep awake, but there was nothing on which I could keep my focus. Darkness was all around us, underneath us, everywhere. And darkness was inside me. I didn't regret leaving Libya. I cannot tell you how much I suffered there. My life was not worth anything anymore. Then I heard a shout, ship, ship. I was so weak, I couldn't shout. I couldn't cry, I couldn't move, but I saw the light. As the ship came closer, I felt that I had died and was being reborn. Irregular journeys across the Mediterranean Sea have become so normalized that they are rarely reported by the media anymore. And yet the Mediterranean Sea remains one of the most deadly crossings, in particular, the central Mediterranean, which is what we will be talking about. Official statistics present large numbers of deaths. This is just this year, up till the 6th September. Official statistics present large number of deaths, which we can safely assume is an underestimate. More pertinently, these statistics do not include the people whose boats are being pushed back to Libya. The current Italian and Maltese policy, many of whom will end up in detention in Libya and in difficult living conditions, which can also result in death. Forced migrants can have many reasons for packing up and leaving their homes, conflict, persecution, dif difficult living conditions, and so on. In the last weeks on the mass media, we have all seen the desperation of people who are trying to leave Afghanistan. Many more will still be trying to leave in a few months or a few years time, 
even when the mass media stop reporting about this conflict. In 2015, we saw an increase in arrivals. The associated spectacle moved people. You might recall the images of people walking across borders in the Balkans and people using the Mediterranean routes. European member states quickly enacted a number of policies in order to address what they labeled as a crisis. I join fellow colleagues who take issue with this term because as practitioners working at these borders will tell you, the EU and its member states like Italy, Greece and Malta have been dealing with these constant arrivals as an emergency, as a crisis for the past two decades. The magnitude of the migration flows and the makeup of nationalities shift every year, but these journeys are a constant across the Mediterranean Sea. One of the main developments during the 2015 increase in arrivals was a consolidation of the first reception system in the Mediterranean, referred to as the hotspot approach. This is one of the main pillars of EU border and migration policy. In theory, it was meant to be a temporary approach to deal with the crisis at the border, but although the crisis was officially deemed over by the European Commission in 2020, it is still in place today. First reception is still today characterized by forced and controlled immobility of people. And just as it was before and during the refugee crisis, it is still governed as a permanent state of emergency. In states of emergency, governments suspend elements of the normal legal order and strip individuals of rights. First reception is still governed as though there was the state of emergency with the difference that it now uses more sophisticated technology and is overall better funded. I draw here on Giorgio Agamben's work on biopolitics and the state of exception, um, though I won't go into it for reasons of time. But indeed, first reception or border control renders refugees to bear life, powerless and rightless. And whereas I recognize that there are cracks in the portrayal of such a stark picture of subjugation, practitioners and solidarity activists have shared how arbitrary these cracks are. It is often very difficult for anyone to offer quality assistance to the people who are in dire need of care because they are so severely restricted by the system. And just by way of background, there are several factors that produce these situations and these journeys. First, refugee flows persist because the push factors are present. Wars, conflicts, violence, and loss of livelihood in countries of origin and in transit countries. B, the borders of the global north have become more and more selective. And we know that there has been a significant development since the Schengen Agreement in, um, in the European Union. The borders are more selective and more difficult to access for poor people. I refer you here to Bridget Anderson's work and her book, um, Us and Them. C, this is what creates the need for irregular routes. Since borders are more difficult to cross and because it is often the only route, the only way a person can apply for asylum. Remember, we still use the territorial imperative um, you know, in order to allow people to apply for asylum. So they need to cross over the border in some way. So what is the mental health state of refugees? A research study conducted by Médecins Sans Frontières drawing on material collected between October 2014 and December 2015 in the province of Ragusa gives us a glimpse of this. The study called Neglected Trauma, Asylum Seekers in Italy, an analysis of mental health distress and access to healthcare. It draws on over 300 interviews with refugees who sought their services. 
It includes a few refugees, very few refugees who were in first reception. Most were in secondary reception centers. I will explain the difference in a little bit. However, the findings are worrying. 60% showed signs of mental health problems. 42% of the patients had complaints compatible with post-traumatic stress disorder. 27% with anxiety and 19% with depression. This study was used as a basis in order to start a new service in Palermo, the only service that I, I'm currently aware of, um, that MSF is running in Sicily together with the local authorities, which offers therapeutic services for people suffering from trauma or from violence um, in their country of origin or um, during the journey. It is a very small project, which you know, should be used as a best practice um, example. When refugees reach European shores, they have often been on the move for several years and endured hardships on the way. The sheer happiness and relief signaled in the descriptions of Murad as being reborn are typical of refugees arriving along this route, the Central, Maritime, Central Mediterranean Maritime Route. They feel, they finally feel they have reached a safe destination where they can rebuild their lives, where they can rebuild um, or remake a home. At first reception, migrants are particularly vulnerable. They are exhausted, tired, and weary from their journey. Some might have lived intensely traumatic experiences on land or the sea journey, which at times can stretch even three to four years. They are vulnerable, not just because of the physical condition and the weariness, the exhaustion. They are also vulnerable because they are in a new situation having to navigate a European system which is alien and having to live in crowded conditions with strangers from different cultures. The vulnerability at this nexus in their migration journey therefore stems both from their individual experiences but also from their position within the European reception system. They do not know European culture, they do not know European bureaucracy, they do not know European border control. Many Europeans do not know European border control either. In addition to this, the European first reception system does nothing to empower the refugees. It is designed as border control based on principles of exclusion and subjugation and approached as a crisis, which is why humanitarian services are also provided. Ironically, this first reception system for maritime migrants has little to do with reception, care, or hospitality, but is instead dictated by border control and security interests. Elsewhere, I have discussed how the concept of hospitality in the migration field might better be conceptualized as plastic hospitality, since its strength lies in the discursive field it has created and not in practice. The strength lies, it does not in practice, not in facilitating the implementation of hospitality. Ironically, the discursive field constructed around hospitality facilitates an unwelcoming and a series of hostile relationships. So what is first reception? First reception in different parts of Europe can be different. First reception in the Mediterranean is very much akin to border control in other parts of the world. So in Northern Europe, the type and the, the, the models of first reception are completely different to, um, to what is going on in the Mediterranean. And that is, you know, Greece, Cyprus, Malta, Italy, and Spain. First reception refers to this picture denotes plastic hospitality. This is one of the centers where migrants are hosted and taken care of. 
I will move on. Um, first reception refers to the very, very first part of the migrant reception system, which overlaps with the border system. The aim is threefold, implementing the procedures related to identification, registration and classification for security purposes, as well as to ascertain the status of the migrant. Second, first reception aims to find accommodation for um, these newcomers, and third, to treat or see to urgent humanitarian needs, such as water, um, food, and first aid. For example, you know, first reception in Italian law only refers very briefly to the accommodation, which is needed, accommodation which is needed to carry out the operations to define the legal position of the foreigner. So there's no mention of care. First reception is, however, further regulated by EU policy, in particular, this hotspot approach, which was enacted by the European Commission during the 2015 increase to help member states dealing with situations of crisis. The hotspot approach has been called a management approach and serves as a platform for cooperation among EASO, the European Asylum Agency, Frontex, Europol, and Eurojust. So Europol are, EASO is the, the asylum agency, Frontex are the European um, border guards, Europol are the European police, and Eurojust um, have to do with um, justice. And the aim is to swiftly process asylum applications enforce return decisions and prosecute migrant smuggling. It's a very tall order for any, um, any project. These EU agencies together with national officials come together to identify, fingerprint, screen and register asylum applicants, organize relocation to other member states for those who qualify and quickly organize the return of those who either do not apply for international protection or those whose right to remain on the territory has ceased. The period of first reception is envisaged to be short with migrants supposedly um, being processed quickly and redirected to respective centers and eventually moved on to secondary reception centers. This model um, is also being used in other countries where the hotspot approach is not being implemented. For example, in Malta, there was no um, hotspot. There wasn't a need for a hotspot identified, but um, the model, the Malta's initial reception center is modeled exactly on, um, on the same center. So the, the hotspot approach can be triggered at any point. So in tandem with this processing of migrants and the registering and the interrogation, a range of humanitarian services are also offered to refugees. They are aimed at alleviating suffering in the short term, since this is approached as a crisis, and therefore health services include hospitalization or any immediate treatment, which is generally administered either by the local health authorities or by NGOs in collaboration with local, regional or national authorities. Conceptually, the EU's policy approach in designing first reception can be described as one constructed on what the medical anthropologist Didier Fassan has called contemporary humanitarianism, which is a critique of humanitarianism. Contemporary humanitarianism, rather than facilitating the implementation of humanitarian ideals, uses humanitarian language as a smokescreen to further other political interests which might not benefit the refugees. In his writings about the saint Papier in France back in 2005, he he argues that humanitarianism should not be a substitute for political struggles against systemic oppression. The dear Fassan was a physician, was a doctor, 
um, originally and um, working, started working with Metsam Sam Frontier, did um, further his studies in anthropologist and is now a medical anthropologist. And so knows, knows the process and sort of the two sides of the story, both the medical and the political and the cultural processes. So the first reception system has been conceptualized as a humanitarian border. And in a humanitarian border, what you have are the intertwining of humanitarian and security issues. The humanitarian border refers to the proliferation of migrant aid organizations and humanitarian services offered also by security and border control entities present in borderlands. So what we have in a situation um, which we call the humanitarian border is a situation where humanitarian organizations help keep the border control system afloat and border control also doubles their hand in, um, in humanitarian issues. For example, in providing accommodation or um, in, in protecting um, people in need. But rather than being built on the recognition of shared humanity, the humanitarian border produces zones of humanitarian government where care functions as a technology of border enforcement, thus increasing the state's power to govern more bodies and more spaces. These political processes, while not apparent, explain the current setup of first reception. They explain why first reception is carried out in securitized spaces where civilian access is totally restricted. Indeed, only authorized personnel and organizations are allowed in. For example, only a few NGOs who contractually provide services are allowed to operate. No NGOs are permitted to conduct human rights monitoring. As an aside, the advantages of long-term and ethnographic fieldwork is what permitted access to these areas. This trust building with gatekeepers takes a long time. Refugees spend from a few days to a few months in these spaces. People have um, been kept on the wharf in different ports for up to two weeks, three weeks, and sleeping in tents which do not have sides. They are very different. The first reception spaces are very different spaces. They are, you know, the disembarkation wharf, the first reception hotspot center, which is a detention center. There are temporary shelters but they all share the fact that they are securitized spaces, including the transportation of the individuals, including at times handcuffing um, for people who need to go to hospital and so on. Refugees are treated first as potential criminals who have entered a territory in an unauthorized fashion and only secondary, only second as people who might be in, in need of humanitarian aid. It is only after first reception that refugees are treated as people seeking sanctuary, as refugees. So in this period of time, these people are best conceptualized as irregularized. That's where the word is coming from, irregularized um, migrant, although they are refugees who have a right to enter the territory um, in this way, a recognized right. Despite repeated calls by the Council of Europe and case law by the European Court of Human Rights, human rights are not mainstreamed at the border. Access to health, access to asylum, dignified treatment, all are denied. This brings us back to Giorgio Agamben's analysis of the camp. In this case, first reception spaces in their collectivity can be conceptualized as a camp. People are stripped of rights in these spaces. 
people who have surpassed innumerable challenges to arrive to these shores are thus initiated into a system which subjugates them. No wonder they refer to the system as a system that breaks them. It is therefore very difficult to speak of the provision of care services or any services to address concerns of health, mental health or well-being of refugees. This is a situation where state enacted institutions contribute directly or by omission to harming refugees. The effects of the humanitarian border policy enacted by the EU in first reception are evident and visible. The range of emotions from crying, a feeling of helplessness to anger and the feeling of subjugation are very present. Ahmed, um, these are not their real names, of course, had been in the center in Sikuliana um, in the province of Agrigento for two months. I met him in the first week of his arrival. He was very tired, but happy and grateful to be in a safe space. Two months later, he had been registered, interviewed, interrogated, and had passed through the whole first reception process. He had informed them he would like to apply for asylum. He was waiting to be moved to a secondary reception center. The center he was in, in Sikuliana, which you can see here, is in a tiny remote and sleepy village in Western Sicily. It was not officially a hotspot center, but it was being temporarily used to implement the hotspot approach. Refugees were not allowed to leave the center, but because it was difficult to fence the building, they could register and leave with a strict curfew and no meals and snacks would be saved for them. In practice, the center was extremely isolated. The twice daily buses that passed through Siculiana to go to Agrigento, which was over an hour away, were not predictable. Refugees had no money for the journey anyway, and they were threatened with deportation if they missed the curfew. Ahmed was very angry when I met him the second time. His eyes were bloodshot and he was very tense. The care worker told me that his behavior was verging on the aggressive. Why are they keeping me here? What is the reason for this? Do they care about my asylum application? How long will I be here for? Look at him, you know, and here he describes what other people in the center are going through. I'm just going to skip to the part in red. Do they care? Maybe, but we are a number for them. One goes and another comes. We are broken now. We have no energy left. Where will I find the energy to work when I get freedom? This system breaks people. The center at Siculiana is very different to the hotspot of Milo in Trapani, called the best practice model for hotspots in the European Union. It was, a once, it was once a high security prison, as you can see, there are over three gates to go through to get in and out of the center. The hotspot of Milo is known as the best practice hotspot because its management was competent, humane, and there was an efficient processing of people to secondary reception centers. So the average length of stay in the center was very short. This notwithstanding, refugees expressed fear and helplessness. One of the West African women refugees I spoke to told me she had been in the center for over three weeks because they had not found place for her in a secondary reception center. She spoke kindly of the staff, but told me that waiting is killing her. I stay in bed all day now, waiting, waiting. It's like I don't have any energy left. Maybe it's the food or the pills they give me to sleep. They say that outside it is not safe, but this is Europe, no? I want to go to Milan. My husband and my brother are there. I have not seen them for over four years. This is a classic example of overprotection by, um, by the operators of the center who are scared that she will end up in prostitution rings when she would be much better if she were to be in a safe space with her relatives. Research has shown that immigration detention is a growing threat to the physical and mental well-being of migrants. I refer here to studies by JRS Europe, by Samson. Um, you know, I, I can 
sort of share these studies as um, in question time or later on. The risks to the physical and mental health of migrants posed by detention, irrespective of the presence of safeguarding policies. Um, see, for example, the pan-European study becoming vulnerable in detention by JRS Europe. Robiant et al.'s study of the mental health outcomes of detaining asylum seekers found high levels of mental health problems in detainees. These included anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, disorder as well as self-harm and suicidal ideation. Among the contributing factors identified were the deprivation of liberty, the conditions of detention, the institutional rhythm, and also indicative, indicatively a deep sense that their detention was unjust, irrespective of whether this was an administrative detention center or a punitive detention center, that is a prison. It made no difference for the migrants. Another recent study conducted by Michaela Heine on the determinants of mental health amongst migrants in Canada concludes that whilst pre-migration trauma does predict mental disorders and PTSD, the post-migration context can be an equally powerful determinant of mental health. Significantly, it also shows that post-migration factors may moderate the ability of refugees to recover from pre-migration trauma. In line with these findings, again, um, Robiant et al. in a different study, conclude that migrant detention results in much higher and more severe mental health problems among immigration detainees as compared to asylum seekers living in the community. Irrespective of what, what a migrant has been through, immigration detention is a source of physical and mental health problems. And I will end this part with a quote which describes life and gives a glimpse into operations into one of the centers. I refer you to the parts in, in red. These are the kinds of situations that you know I was um, I, you know, I was finding all the time. So a UNHCR official, this is this from Mikel, who's a cultural mediator. He has been a cultural mediator with different organizations in, um, in Sicily over the years. And here he was in Siculiana. A UNHCR official told me that she identified three women, 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 sorry for the spelling mistake, who were raped and recommended fast tracking to the police. They were bleeding, that's how um, they identified them. I got to know, Tesfa Mikel says, that there are 25 women who were gang raped in the same center in Libya. The women were raped and their men were beaten up in front of them every day in the Libyan prison for over a month. I mentioned this, I mentioned this this morning to the police and to EASO and they told me, how will we manage to fast track everyone? This vulnerability business I'm jumping is just to appear good. They are autonomous human beings and they will learn how to make a life. Just give them a chance out of this prison. In this rare outburst, Tesfa Mikel captured some of the problems of the hotspot system and pointed to state policy and state enacted institutions as one of the major factors leading to the deteriorating mental health of newly arrived migrants. The issue of the identification of vulnerable individuals is controversial on several accounts, and I will refrain from going into it um, here. However, from a discursive point of view, what we have seen is a shift from the trope of the criminal refugee to that of the vulnerable refugee. And while vulnerability appears to signal a more humane approach, in effect, it also facilitates paternalistic interventions which limit the autonomy and agency of the individual. This one, Mikkel's quote, also points to another issue that might be less obvious the impact of the humanitarian border on the mental health of border workers, of practitioners, what Lipsky calls street level bureaucrats. So anyone working with humanitarian organizations, the police, anyone working within the system. The toll on the mental health of some of these border workers is harsh. And here I include 
healthcare practitioners, security officials, such as border guards and police. In interviews I had with them, many revealed a discomfort with their work. This showed in their narratives, which oscillated from concern and compassion for the migrants to a need to appear rational and professional by highlighting security concerns. This discomfort in what I have referred to as the narrations of the humanitarian border derives from what Vaughan Williams has maintained. The contemporary figure of the refugee is perceived both as a potential threat and as a life that is threatened. I will share with you two more short quotes before my concluding remarks. This is Ernesto, a, med a medical doctor. This is the hotspot of Lampedusa. Um, Ernesto, a medical doctor at the hotspot of Lampedusa. Um, for those of you who are very quick at reading, I put the whole quote in, but I will focus on the part in re red. I am not allowed to criticize the system because my role is that of treating ill people, he says with sarcasm. But I can see around me that people are getting ill because of the system. Do you think this was the reason I studied this profession? I want out just as much as those migrants. And then I will join them in protesting their situation on the streets. But here I can do nothing. Um, the next time I visited Lampedusa, Roberto was not working in the hotspot um, anymore. I, he, he still works as a medical doctor, however, because of course the rate of burnout is also very high. During their work, border workers feel responsible, guilty, ashamed, proud for the activity they're engaging in, but also for their behavior towards the migrants, since this is often conditioned by the structures in place, which are outside their control. One of the psychologists working in the Lampedusa hotspot shared with me similar feelings of helplessness. Her services were of little use within the center. Therapy with critical cases was interrupted after a couple of sessions once they were moved out of the center. She felt like her main role was that of giving them courage to survive the system. Another example of um, how conflicted border workers can be is the following um, that was shared to me by Roberto, a police officer, on the controversial issue of using force to extract fingerprints from migrants, a policy that even the police union had reacted against. He repeated over and over again, referring to policymakers, they are not the ones who have to look into the eyes of the people they restrain. And all this for what? adding, at the end of the day, I thank God that I have my job and my family, but they have nothing. I cannot offer them anything, but I also have to protect my family. That is, I also have to earn money, but it's difficult. I have included all these direct quotations, which have taken me over the time allocated, but I think that communicating the voices of refugees and the people that we study, including border workers, is very important. I strongly believe that quotations are what connect the person being researched with the researcher and the reader in a unique way. And finally, I'll just end on this note. Um, the EU's first reception system in the Mediterranean is not designed to offer dignified treatment to refugees, let alone treat refugees' mental health. It allows us, it shows us, to borrow a title from Rhys Jones' book, how violent borders can be in obvious and less obvious ways. By treating the arrival of maritime refugees as an emergency and a crisis, the EU legitimizes its own management model of exceptionalism. This renders people powerless and helpless and has short and also long-term repercussions on their mental health. This architecture of violence was further consolidated and tightened during the refugee crisis. It is still with us today. I have tried in this short lecture to give an idea of the social and political forces at play. The strength of the discursive field is such that, for example, the idea of hospitality or humanitarian ideas 
as underpinning values goes unquestioned. Without an overall understanding of these social and political processes, any attempts to intervene or treat refugees in a dignified manner at first reception are useless. For refugees and compassionate practitioners, it is difficult to escape the harmful effects of this architecture of violence. I myself, as a field researcher, have not been immune to it. Qualitative research, and particularly ethnographic field research of this kind, provides ample opportunities for documenting the ethnographically visible, but we can also become very uncomfortable witnesses of social injustice. I'll end on this note, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, we have time for discussion, for comments, for questions on this thoughtful presentation. Please raise your hand if you would like to ask or comment something. Angela, is this a clap or do you want to comment? It, it's a clap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead, Ashra. Uh, thank you, Daniela, for that presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, so policymakers are kind of cold and rational, and then people on the front line are the warm and emotional side of it. How do we um, sort of get a balance of both? And is the possibility of getting a balance of both? Mm -hmm. I don't think the difference is as, you know, as black and white as this. Yeah. And bear in mind that I think the main difference between field workers and policymakers is that field workers actually meet the migrants at first reception. So it is very difficult for a field worker to speak or badmouth or migrants who arrive in this way, people who arrive in this way when they know they know the situation that they arrive in one of the border workers once told me he told me um disembarkation it's like witnessing seeing the remnants of war right so it's very difficult to reconcile that with the discourse of smuggling of, in, of interrogating people because they might be terrorists and so on so i think the encounter with the migrant at first reception is a very particular experience um, along this route because they arrive in this um, very bad state. What can we do? I think, um, I think I encourage policymakers to listen more to field workers. I encourage policymakers to spend more time um, in the field because I think it's this kind of community. Often field workers are seen as the lowest rung of a hierarchical organizations. So their views are not taken um, into consideration when policies are drafted or designed. Thank you. Hey, then. Steffi, please. Um, sorry about the background noise. My, my son um, decided not to leave me alone today. First of all, I wanted to say, well done. It was an excellent, excellent, um, speech. I think something that struck me is um, when I work with people who kind of do the interviews for the people, I, I guess in Malta, to kind of see if they would benefit from protection, the helplessness that they feel when they genuinely feel like there's a case that needs protection and then the people above them just won't hear it at all. And they're kind of like, no, just say, you know, and, and, and I think the lack of kind of, you know, I guess they have some form of debriefing and stuff like that, but I guess the long-term impact and especially that quite a few young people are going into this profession and the immense helplessness that they feel, it's almost like they tell me, what's the point of listening to six hours of interviewing these people when then our opinion isn't even taken into account? And I think that struck me, especially when I was then listening to your presentation as well. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Thanks for sharing this. 
I strongly think that people working in this field need support. Um, and we need more studies on burnout rates as well, because you know, I don't have the figures at hand. I'm, you know, I, I was doing ethnographic research, but I could see this, right? I made friends with people who moved on, even though you know, it was their mission in life to work with refugees, but because they couldn't handle it anymore after they had children or um, you know, after being in it for some time. Um, even with researchers, I, I had a previous project on uh, people, we were interviewing people at risk of deportation in Sweden, again, a highly emotive um, field. And I've been, I've been doing this work for a long time. I was also a volunteer and an activist um, before. So I have my, my own support network of, um, you know, of friends and academics. Um, but I made sure that the research assistants that were employed on my project um, were also supported regularly and professionally as well. Um, and in fact, after that project, um, one of them decided that she did not want to work with refugees anymore. She changed the job, uh, despite the fact that she had um, support. So, you know, we're speaking of, of, of fields which, where people are doing work which is highly emotive. But of course, um, I think this, this is the same in other fields where people are working and seeing suffering at such close um, proximity. What we don't have at all is mental health support for people, right? I mean, rather than mental health support, I think dignified treatment, right? We have a situation where, where, where migrants are not helped in order to feel well um, or to recover, but start feeling worse after being in the European reception system. And then of course the, the border workers or the field workers needs, need, need to face this all the time. Yes, thank you. Further questions or remarks? Yes, you, please, I see you. Yeah. Hi. We, we had an interesting discussion earlier this morning about the tensions or conflicts that arise amongst community mental health practitioners whose roles are constrained by the context within which they're operating and the limits that those roles place upon their ability to interact authentically with their clients. Mm -hmm. their ex the expectations upon them are that they perform in a particular way to fulfill their professional role and status. And aren't you describing something very similar mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. And doesn't it actually take us into that interesting world where we begin to see, in fact, a whole array of conflicts between institutional expectations upon people in paid roles mm -hmm. and their freedom to express or engage in authentic relationships with the people that they are engaging with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a sense, there's an interesting, much wider picture to consider here, which has implications for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why have I got some? Oh, it's all right. it's all right. I got some ridiculous pop up about Boris Johnson just then while I was saying that. I don't know whether that was a divine intervention. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think the, the the word you used, authentic um, encounters, or you know authentic that is that was the main lament um, mm. you know people wanted to do some people right not everyone but some wanted to do more but couldn't um, and yeah. so they did what they could you know the classic policeman who appears like really rough and then um, would have bought uh, drawing books and sweets for the children in the center. 
um, and gives them this stuff in gives them to me so I give them to the children so he appears uh, um, also in front of his colleague yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes before Petya you say something uh, I would like to add something to that because you spoke about burnout uh, Daniela and I think what is um, one of the important issues about burnout that um, if you have a double let's say um, command or uh, from your perspective you want to help but there are restrictions around you um, which uh, enable you to actually uh, yes uh, be effective um, so this is something I, I think uh, in work working with uh, certain populations uh, which are which um, face um, uh, jurisdiction and other um, um, aspects like you talked about. So the, the structural violence from Galtung you, you were referring to. I think this, this dealing with this structural uh, violence is extremely um, pointing towards burnout uh, in, in, in the health professionals. Mm -hmm. So Petya, it's your turn, please. Thank you. Um, I'm from Bulgaria, and as you know, Bulgaria is one of the gates towards Europe. Um, and this topic is really hot here at that time, and the attitudes are really polarized and um, changing all the time. And um, it's like we are um, somewhere between our humanity and um, us feeling scared of these um, strange people that are coming or uh, we don't know them and so what can we do? Do we have to be um, humans and help them or there are some kind of uh, threat for us? And uh, that reminded me of a quote of um, Umberto Maturana. I will put it here in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very... Mm -hmm. Thank you, Petya, for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. as, you, as you said, Daniela, um, it is in every in every country in Europe, and the situation is different. And um, I know, for example, from Bulgaria that many people left there as well. So um, migrated to other parts of Europe. And so it's a totally different feeling for the people who, who stayed in Bulgaria to accept foreigners than, for example, in other countries where um, let's say uh, the population did not lost, uh, lose uh, three, one third um, um, of the inhabitants. So it is really uh, European wise, a very complicated issue. I, I got um, a message from the moderator. I can stay with you uh, a little longer. So if you would like to discuss, please Angela, go ahead. Yeah, I was keeping back because I can always meet Daniela and have a conversation with her. And my question is very personal. It's uh, directed to the researcher. Um, what is your experience of uh, researching uh, these very difficult uh, um, scenarios and uh, sort of... Uh, I am interested in your um, the emotions that they trigger in you, and uh, sort of what keeps you going, uh, and um, the personal the personal uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just um, comment very briefly on the burnout. Um, before um, sharing with you my personal experience. Um, the issue of burnout is particularly problematic because 
as you all know, people who are experiencing burnout will find it more difficult to treat others in a humane way. So we have this vicious cycle in these towns in Sicily, which, I, which are very observable, towns where there is very little employment for people. People get burnt out, but do not have a choice, need to continue working in the center. They need, you know, they're a social worker and they have to continue working in the center. They don't have a choice. They have a family. They're a cleaner in the center. They, they don't have a choice. They have to stick around and face this all the time with the result that even the kindest people become hardened, um, not to speak of worse um, things happening. So I really encourage research on burnout. Um, Angela, it's, I think it's, these are very hard fields to, um, to research. I have stuck around because I happened in, in my younger days to spend a lot of time in detention with people in Malta in detention. Um, as a volunteer and as an activist, and I am still friends with one of the one of the group, um, one of the groups that I met. You know the individuals, so I'm still in touch with them, and they are the ones who you know, who, you know they they are the ones who who thank me for sticking around. Right? They say, um, you know, one of the people I last met in Brussels a few years ago, he told me. Um, you know, Daniela, we left the tension many years ago, but you are still in it. Um, you know, and he said it with, you know, we were joking and then he said, you know, it, it's like you need to let go of it, just like we moved on, you need to move on um, too. But I met him again the following day with his um, children. Um, I went, to, went with him to pick up his children from school and he told me, you know, I'm glad you keep doing this work because we need more people. And it's these, you know, it's these little words of encouragement um, that I think that, that make us stick on. But there is deep social, there is deep injustice going on. And there's a lot of harm to individuals who do not, you know, no one deserves to be treated um, in that way. Of course, teaching helps as well, because I think through teaching, we get to share um, some of these issues with students. And, you know, we can see this development of, um, you know, through reading and through learning more, students become more compassionate as well. So I think it's also about building good citizens um, in our society, not just good um, researchers. Um, I have a supplementary question, small one. Yes, cool. Uh, I, I, I was also thinking about um, the link you have with policy makers and um, your role as the country, you know, uh, expert on, on, on this and, and, and on the country report. How do you maneuver in what is your, how do you position yourself? And, uh, uh, you know, uh, do you see that uh, and when you're talking as well internationally, because it's this is a very complex issue, I don't need to tell you, <laughs> you, you very know, how do you see, you know, the future uh, on this and your position? It's very difficult. I, I am, as a person, always open to engaging with policymakers. The previous project to this involved policymakers um, directly in the project and you know the results were communicated to different groups of policymakers. Um, but unfortunately the policy direction is what it is. We have seen a lot more money going to fund Frontex, the border guards, rather than to fund um, these reception centers. Right or or the European Asylum Agency, for that matter. Right, so the policy approach is one that prioritizes border control and security, um, and does not take into consideration human rights or the dignity of these people. 
So it is difficult to engage um, with policymakers. You know, I have, I am invited to conferences. I speak when I can. I, I, I keep the voices of the people that speak to me in this, um, in my presentations, hoping that this will touch a chord sometimes. But the policy approach is what it is. We have seen in the 20 years of being in touch with this field, we have seen a huge deterioration. And so we, we have not seen, you know, we have not, we are not seeing better reception systems for refugees. For example, during the refugee crisis, Italy never detained newly arrived asylum seekers at reception, never. But with the refugee crisis and the enactment of the hotspot approach by the European Union, for the first time, the hotspots were detention centers. So instead of, we're seeing regression um, in many ways. And when you've been doing research in the same field for so long, it's, um, it's difficult to see this kind of, of regression. I choose, because those are the people that give me access as well, to stick around with practitioners and people who want to bring about change, even if it's little change in any way. So I, I position myself there, but it's, you know, it's, if policymakers and politicians do not want to hear, then, uh, you know, they have other interests, then, you know, they will, yeah. they will not engage. We have seen this a number of times, Angela, there was during the refugee crisis, a panel of migration experts were invited by the European Parliament. And basically they said, you know, um, they said research for the past 25 years has been telling you that what you're doing is harming refugees. That by deporting refugees back, it doesn't mean that they will stay in their country of origin. They will move again and some will come back to Europe, right? Or you will put strain on other countries surrounding. Don't tell people that you are being sent home when they have been in France for 10 years. France is their home now. So don't tell them that Afghanistan is their home. Remember that the EU has made agreements with Afghanistan and has returned thousands, thousands of Afghanis back in the last decade. And the agreement was part of an EU aid um, agreement with Afghanistan. So Afghanistan received aid money from the EU on condition that it also accepted returnees. So many people were being sent back to situations where there was so much hardship. And now, and now they want to leave again. Um, Anyhow, Daniela, I think we have to continue. <laughs> Yes, we have to we continue. Have to. Uh, I mean, um, it is something uh, stronger, um, and I think uh, it's good that uh, we, as yes, <laughs> as humans, uh, have something inside us, um, which might maybe this voice becomes very um, um, soft or. Yeah, when, when you are in other roles, and um, I agree with you, uh, politics are, um, is a system of its own. It operates uh, on its own uh, logic, and um, sometimes I even think this is a quite provocative uh, idea in the end, that um, we should reflect on what maybe our humanitarian aid also stabilizes in terms of the general situation. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> anyhow, this is, uh, thank you very much for, for your presentation, for your thoughtfulness and um, all the best for you and uh, for all uh, the participants. I would like to invite you to our final meeting um, at, uh, let me check the time.
timetable at 3.45 for at the closing. Uh, yes, 3.45 yeah. uh, for the closing ceremony. Yes, you're right. um, so thanks again for attending and um, be well. Thank you, Daniela. Bye-bye. <laughs>